Chapter Two, The Doorway to the Invisible School. I returned to my residency in the psychiatry department of the hospital the next morning. I had renewed hope that my chosen field would acknowledge the soul and the healing power that awareness of it can bring. I had heard that there was a change occurring at other hospitals and in psychiatry as a whole, that it was beginning to incorporate the human spirit into healing. Surely my experience and interests could be of service here. I entered the psychiatry ward of the hospital that day, eager to see the signs of healing and soul awareness in my colleagues and patients. The scene was much the same as it was in my first few days there, however. Patients sat in their beds and on the hallway floors, some staring at their hands, some staring at the air in front of them, some talking or whispering to unseen beings. Nurses stood at bedsides, handling patients' cups of water and dispensing pills one by one until they were all swallowed. Other residents found empty examining rooms and stairwells to hide in so they wouldn't be disturbed by the patients and nurses. Supervising physicians walked into a patient's room, checked the medical records, left without speaking to the patient or the nurse there, and tracked down a resident in the cafeteria to berate him or her for not following the standard procedure for treating a particular disorder. The only real difference in the psychiatric ward was that I was beginning to have a transformed understanding of the physical universe. Now I could see energies around the patients. This energy was like the glow I had seen while meditating with Lila the night before. If I focused, everything glowed and radiated outward. The glow of the more severe patients were opaque compared to the healthy nurses. A couple of months after my evening with Lila, I received a phone call at the hospital. I had arranged to have a local Santiago publisher release a book of my poetry, and he was calling to tell me, they're here. I immediately rushed downtown to pick up my first copies. The publisher's office was a fairly modern two-story building. In the center of a round cobblestone plaza in front of the building stood a statue of a military officer holding a bayonet rifle, which offered an unfriendly welcome. I recalled my first meeting with the publisher months earlier while I was visiting Chile on vacation from Boston. After passing the statue, I found the rather cramped office on the second floor. In it, a balding man with thick glasses was smoking cigarettes, dangerously close to the several towering stacks of papers. After introductions, I had handed him my manuscript. I sat in silence, watching him turn the pages. A grin crept across his face, and he nodded at certain points in his reading. After reading almost half the manuscript, he finally set it down and looked up at me. I have to ask you something, he said. Please, I, I said anxiously. Were you high when you wrote this? Excuse me? The publisher picked up my manuscript again and leaned back in his chair. I was just curious. The insights and visions remind me of what one experiences on a mind-altering substance. He stubbed out a cigarette. I was probably in an altered state of consciousness when I wrote some of it, I said carefully. But I got there through meditation, not through drugs. Have you ever tried hallucinogens, he asked, letting his glasses slip down his nose a bit. No, I replied, a bit offended. I never felt the need. The publisher held up his hands in front of him. That's fine with me. If you're really going through that sort of thing you write about, though, maybe you could use more help than your meditation. He pulled several books off a filing cabinet in the corner behind his desk. He sat down again and looked at me very seriously. You have to try it sometime, but you should do it as I do it, in a sacred manner. There are many substances that have been used in various cultures throughout history to affect a state of understanding that would otherwise take lifetimes to even glimpse. It is the substance itself that teaches. The shaman is simply the caretaker. <laughs>
He pushed a copy of Aldous Huxley's The Doors of Perception toward me on the desk. Huxley describes the psychedelic experience using a Catholic term, gratuitous grace, and compares it to the Apostle Paul's revelation on the road to Damascus. And here, the publisher said, referring to a copy of Houston Smith's The World's Religions, this professor calls it a religious experience. At the time, I told him his examples were not sufficient to change my attitude towards chemically induced altered states. The subject hadn't come up during the book's production, though we had talked on the phone about a dozen times concerning corrections and cover designs and such. The publisher was standing with his back to me when I entered his office this time. In a canyon amid the paper towers on his desk sat two stacks of shiny green paperback books with my name on them. Though this was my second book, I still beamed with pride. How do you like it, the publisher asked as he turned around, adjusting his glasses and smoothing the hair over one ear. I picked up a copy and sat down, trying to appear calm and mature when I was ecstatically happy. It looks very nice, I said. As you can understand, he said, as he sat down across the desk from me, I've had the opportunity to read through the book several times in the past two months. He put a cigarette in his mouth and lit it. I have the feeling from what you wrote here, he continued, pointing to the stacks of green books, that you might benefit from meeting a friend of mine. Who is it, I asked. Oh, the two of you have a lot in common, he replied. He took a small yellow pad out of one of the desk drawers and wrote down a name and phone number. Call this man, he said, and tell him I thought you needed an initiation. I took the slip of paper and about a dozen copies of my new book, thanked the publisher, and left. I was suspicious, but also intrigued by his suggestion that I needed an initiation. That night, I called the number on the yellow slip of paper below the name Don Eduardo. An older woman with a refined accent answered the phone. I asked to speak with Don Eduardo. She paused for a moment and then told me she would go get him. Hello, a man's voice said. Don Eduardo, I ventured. The man, the man on the other end of the phone line laughed. Please just called me Eduardo. And who are you? My name is Carlos Warder, I said. I'm a doctor at the university hospital. I just published a book of poetry and my publisher advised me to call you. He said I needed an initiation. Why don't you join us for dinner tomorrow night instead, Eduardo said. I would like to meet you. I agreed. He gave me his address and told me to arrive around 8 o'clock. The man seemed friendly, and my social life was not yet busy enough, nor my finances substantial enough to turn down a free dinner. The foyer of Don Eduardo's house was a long, narrow corridor. An oriental carpet ran its 15 feet in length. Lush green plants and purple and pink flowers hung in pots on the walls between the row of narrow windows on either side. At the end were two steps leading up to a perpendicular hallway. At the intersection of the two hallways, a huge mask covered with bright paints and feathers hung on the wall, bathed in a stream of light, originating from somewhere in the ceiling beams. I was standing in front of the mask, trying to decide which direction to go, when a man who appeared to be in his 40s tapped me on the shoulder. Please come in, he said slowly and clearly, indicating the hallway to the right. Smiling, he introduced himself. I am Eduardo. Don Eduardo walked as if he knew there was no need to hurry. This was more slowly than I was accustomed to walking, so I had to pause once or twice so I wouldn't get ahead of him. As we walked down the hallway, I could see that Don Eduardo was a distinguished-looking mestizo. That is, one of his parents must have been a native Indian. We passed a couple of darkened rooms on the left and eventually came to a brightly lit room at the end of the hallway. A huge fireplace decorated with statues and musical instruments 
dominated one wall of the room. In the center was a round, heavy wooden table, set with three places and a candelabra. A woman dressed in a white blouse and mid-length dark skirt crossed to greet me. This is my partner, Teresa, Don Eduardo said as I shook hands with the woman. Teresa was tall and slim. The paleness of her skin was in stark contrast to that of Don Eduardo. Though I could tell she must have broken her nose at some point in time, this did not detract from her appearance, but rather made her all the more interesting. I had the impression she was the type of woman whose beauty becomes all the more apparent as more was known about her. I told her you were a doctor of psychiatry, Don Eduardo told me in his patient measured voice. I'm a psychiatrist too, Teresa smiled, brightening her deep dark eyes. I'm working with a botanist on a research project. We're testing plant extracts for their psychoactive properties. I smiled and said, it's very nice to meet you. I had a feeling that the initiation my publisher and Don Eduardo had in mind involved taking some sort of drug. We sat down at the table and were served by a surprisingly energetic servant in her 50s. The conversation seemed to center around my work with my patients and Teresa's work with experimental drugs. The meal was almost over an hour later when I realized that I had learned almost nothing about Don Eduardo, except he liked to collect the art of indigenous peoples and that he had a habit of pulling on the ends of his mustache. I feel like we haven't given you much of a chance to talk, I said to Don Eduardo, as the servant was clearing the plates for dessert. How do you spend your days when you aren't collecting art? Don Eduardo pushed his chair back and pulled on his mustache. I was trained, he said, to pass along the traditions of the elders. I was one of his first initiates, interjected Teresa. What sort of initiation do you teach? I asked on Eduardo. There is a doorway to understanding the self, he replied. A threshold that can only be crossed through lifetimes of spiritual practice. There are plants that can teach you what you need to know to cross that threshold in a single lifetime. There are experiences that can open the mind like no other. We sat in silence as dessert was served. I waited for Don Eduardo to say something more, but he simply ate the pudding placed in front of him. When he finished, he stood up from his chair and began examining the various instruments and statues adorning the fireplace. The servant came to clear the table, and Teresa helped her carry the dishes into the kitchen. I want to thank you for a wonderful evening, I called to Don Eduardo. He turned his head slightly and nodded acknowledgement. I don't think I'm ready for any initiations right now, I continued. He nodded again. I will accompany you out, he said, leading the way back to the front door with the same slow, deliberate gait. As I drove home, I wondered whether I was being too close-minded about the initiation Don Eduardo seemed to be offering. I decided that I wasn't comfortable with the idea and therefore shouldn't pursue it further. The next afternoon, however, I fell asleep while reading a research paper in the library. I dreamt I met a little man only half my height in a room with one door and no windows. He reassured me that no matter what I did, I would always be myself. He suggested my development was weighed down by the pain and confusion of my life's events. You need to lose more of you than the you you think you are in order to discover the you that you really are, he told me. And then he exited through the door. The dream startled me so much that I awakened. I started to consider that my spiritual development might need a jolt after all. And by that evening, I was on the phone with Don Eduardo. We arranged to meet on the following Saturday. I learned Don Eduardo had been initiated as a shaman by the Mapuche Indians. Using the knowledge he acquired from Mapuche, he led me on my first shamanistic journey 
I focused on my intent to clear away the aspects of my false self, all those expectations, labels, and judgments that obscure one's spiritual essence and tried to relax my body and quiet my mind, as Don Eduardo directed. Gradually, my body started feeling a bit numb, and a detailed, expansive vision took form in my mind. I was in a pasture with the sun gently shining down on me. A warm breeze caressed my skin. The breeze grew to a strong gust and then receded to near stillness. I felt a tremendous tranquility, a total detachment from my normal condition. I experienced all my feelings of fear and pain as if they were turned on to their maximum volume, but I was not in the midst of them. I was just observing them clearly. I once again felt as I had with Francoise, a joy and expansiveness I experienced as my soul was transmitted through the farthest reaches of time and space. Then I felt myself descending. I realized I was inside myself, descending from my head into my heart. There I stood on an ocean beach. Two men that I identified as Jesus Christ and Che Guevara walked toward each other, embraced, and melted into a beam of light shooting upward. I felt a sense of liberation that was both political and spiritual at the same time. After that, as I was describing it to Don Eduardo later, I saw angels who came to me and brought me aboard their golden light chariot. My spirit body rode with them up into the sky. I looked down and saw all the people on the ground far below looking up. What did you feel as you were in the chariot looking down at the world? asked Don Eduardo. I was in tears because of the suffering of those below me. I paused. I felt a deep desire to alleviate their pain. That last realization, Don Eduardo said as he got up from the grass where we were sitting outside his home, is the golden key you have been seeking your whole life. It is very important that you remember this experience. With this key, you will unlock your destiny. When you find the lock it fits in, you will be ready for the next step in your spiritual development. I felt energized. Everything I saw as I drove home had a numinous, sacred aura to it. I turned over the last part of my vision in my mind. Don Eduardo said that when I understood what it meant, I would be ready to move on in my development. It seemed service toward others had always been part of my life's purpose. I remembered a scene from when I was three years old. My mother was pushing me in a stroller through a park in Santiago. We passed a sandbox where several children were building castles under the protective gaze of their mothers or nannies. There was one little boy, about my age and also in a stroller. While watching the other children, his head, arms, and feet jerked in frequent spasms. I somehow realized that this other boy would never walk. I wanted to help him so that he could play with the other children in the sandbox. The following day, I sat in an afternoon clinical meeting while one of the psychiatrists, Dr. Max, described a patient of his as an interesting case. A Jewish woman he was treating was in her late 60s and was a Holocaust survivor who suffered frequent bouts of severe debilitating depression. Dr. Max had prescribed Elevil, an antidepressant, but his focus otherwise seemed to be entirely on diagnosing the exact point at which her ego structure collapsed, not on alleviating the depression. Isn't it enough that she survived? I asked Dr. Max. Let's stop wasting our time trying to discover when she had her breakdown and reinforce the spirit that helped her survive four years in a concentration camp. One of the other residents, a very political socialist named Juan, who later died on the same day that the military coup killed Alain, responded, worrying about spiritual well-being is a waste of time. We have thousands of patients. Just give her some medication and move on. After the meeting, I accompanied Juan on his rounds, 
although he and I often disagreed on methods and priorities in public meetings. In private, we got along well because of our common focus on helping the poor. We both worked part-time in the same rural clinic. In a room with four beds, Juan listened to his patient, a tired-looking Mapuche Indian woman in her 50s. She described the fear that she felt of being discharged to her abusive husband and how the little people had told her last night they would not protect her anymore if she went back home. Juan asked her questions only when she stopped talking. He listened intently, making notes in her records every now and then. At one point, after some lengthy writing in her records, Juan stood up, announced that he had to go see other patients, and left. Even though much of psychiatry involves listening, the doctors didn't seem concerned with the deeper meaning of what their patients told them. Instead, they concentrated on whether what a patient said consistently fit an existing theoretical model, whether there was a drug they could prescribe to make the patient's problem less obvious or more manageable, and whether there were sufficient personnel and available beds. Here, too, was a system that allowed for no creativity and no talk of intangibles, like soul and meaning. A patient was assigned a diagnosis thousands of previous patients had received, given drugs and therapy almost identical to those prescribed in the rest of the hemisphere, and discharged or transferred to make room for the thousands of new patients to come later. The context for healing one individual patient was huge. Whether you were the patient or the physician, you felt small by comparison. After observing my patient sleeping fitfully in the fourth bed, I looked at her chart to see if anything new had been added overnight. Evidently, she was awakened at two in the morning and given pills to quiet her muscle spasms and help her sleep. Nothing else had occurred. I noted that the spasms were still continuing but they seemed a bit less frequent. Next, I went to a room with only two beds. The bed near the door was empty, so I sat down there to try to get some response out of the woman in the other bed. I had been assigned to her case after she was admitted and diagnosed as a catatonic schizophrenic. Her record stated her name was Carmen, that she lived with her mother in a small rural town, and that she had not spoken at all since she was admitted two weeks before. Carmen sat upright in bed, staring wide-eyed at the blank wall opposite her, with strands of her long black hair in her face. This was a position I often found her in when I came to visit. I took a look at her treatment records. One-on-one -on -one talking and group therapy had elicited no response from her whatsoever. Blood tests and examinations had revealed nothing wrong with her brain, thyroid, or vocal cords. Carmen's mother was evidently at a loss to recall an event that might have triggered this catatonic state. How are you today, Carmen? I ventured. No response. Do you remember me? I'm Dr. Warder. The young woman's eyelids lowered slightly, but she neither spoke nor acknowledged my presence. If I could detect anything about her mental or emotional state, it was a sort of disillusionment that registered on her face occasionally. I noted that in her records. As I got up to go with my rounds, I looked back at Carmen and decided to try something different with her that weekend. Driving home from the hospital that night, I came upon a collision between two cars. Since the accident seemed recent and there didn't appear to be a doctor on the scene or an ambulance on its way, I pulled over. One of the cars was on its side and looked like it had rolled over so I checked that one first. The driver had been thrown to the passenger side of her vehicle and seemed unconscious. Blood ran across her face and down her neck. One of her legs was oddly twisted beneath her, suggesting a complete fracture. The other car was upright, but its front end was severely smashed from the collision. The passengers, a very young man and woman, were bruised but conscious, though their legs were pinned under the engine block. When the ambulance arrived a few minutes later, I helped the paramedics extract and care for the three victims. The less experienced of the two paramedics seemed to appreciate my help greatly and asked if I would ride with her in the back of the ambulance. I agreed. Within an hour of our arrival at the hospital emergency room, the woman in the car that had rolled died. <laughs> 
Her mother, father, and sister had seen me going into and out of the emergency room while the other doctors were operating on the woman. They stopped me to ask me how she was doing. I felt obligated to tell them she had not survived the surgery. The mother and daughter started to sob, and a look in the father's eyes begged me to offer them the comfort he could not. I searched my memory for the appropriate sentiments. I thought of my family's grief at my grandfather's death 15 years earlier. Two of my uncles seemed particularly devastated by Grandpa's passing. When I happened to mention the dream I'd had in which Grandpa came to me from the afterlife, these uncles wanted to know more. In letters of consolation, I typed on my father's old black Underwood typewriter. I shared the communication from my dream that Grandpa was on the other side, happy and well. I wrote, Grandpa told me that when he died, he had been swept down a tunnel toward a bright light. Angels full of light pointed the way. His parents came to greet him, and he felt peaceful because they seemed to radiate wisdom and contentment. He said dying is a part of living. We shouldn't be afraid of it. And he told me I would help others in grief now that I no longer feared death. I tried to describe for the unfortunate woman's family how I believed the pain and sorrow of earthly life immediately left the body at the moment of death. I told them that even after a traumatic accident, their loved one could find peace. One of the surgeons stood nearby listening. After the family left to sign some papers, he approached me. You can't worry about the emotional side of your patients, he advised. Just fix them up if you can and send them on their way. I thanked him for his attempt to be helpful and called a taxi to get back to my car. Since I was scheduled to work the weekend shift, I came in two days later. After finishing the morning rounds, I went to the room of Carmen, the woman with catatonic schizophrenia. There was now a patient sharing Carmen's room. This other patient was in bed, quietly working on some needlework. I found a chair in the hallway and brought it next to Carmen's bed. Sitting down, I noticed the bedclothes had shifted somewhat from the day before, but otherwise she was still sitting up in the same position, her gaze still fixed at the blank wall. I had found that the simple fact of paying attention to someone created a positive change in them, so I decided to try that with Carmen. There were three forms of attention I believed could help my patients in healing. The first was empathetic appreciation, feeling with compassion and heart-to-heart understanding what patients are going through. The second was respectful listening. And the third was emanating an effective healing presence through a vision of wholeness. One of the books I received from Lila, the Sufi woman, suggested that the meditation she had taught me could also be extended to produce healing. It discussed four steps to facilitate healing work. First, one must remember that one is really one's essence, higher self or soul. This centering work gives one the perspective needed to avoid reacting to the negativity and defenses the patient might direct toward the individual treating him. By remembering the soul, one is able to honor and grant validity to that part of oneself which shields the healer from the patient's layer of defenses and pain. Second, one is aware of the patient as a whole human being and envisions and discerns the essential self or soul within the patient. One must look beyond the labels, diagnosis, gender, situation to accomplish this step. Third, one examines the soul of the patient and acknowledges that the disease or discomfort can be an evolutionary step that it can have purpose. The condition must be thought of as a transforming experience so that disempowering thoughts of victimization can be avoided. And fourth, one suspends all judgments. One cannot think about why the patient is not well, whether the healing techniques being used will work, why the patient is reacting a certain way or anything else that would get in the way of focusing on the person as a whole and sacred being. Sometimes it is difficult to silence that part of the mind that constantly judges things, people, and events. It can be considered sufficient not to focus on those judgments. 
thereby decreasing their power to manifest. This last step in preparation for healing seemed particularly important to me after seeing progress in another patient, Bernard, the past few days. Bernard was a working class man in his 30s who had been experiencing disturbing, vivid hallucinations. Though he was a strong man who had worked long hours at his job in the past, his current condition was completely debilitating. Although he was under the care of one of the other doctors, I usually said hello to him during my rounds. I had looked at his file the week before and found pages and pages of his doctor's notes describing in careful detail Bernard's various hallucinations. Every time the doctor came, he asked about Bernard's symptoms, that is, the hallucinations. I realized that this particular focus was keeping Bernard stuck in his hallucinations. I decided to shift Bernard's attention from his disease to his future so that he would view his hallucinations as obstacles to his dreams instead of confirmation of his illness. When I asked him how he was doing, he responded with a list of his problems and fears. I told him those aspects of himself were only temporary. I was trying to get to know the real Bernard, I told him. I asked him about his plans for the future. Well, I'm going to stay here, he told me, his large bulky body showing physical signs of fear. Well, what are you going to do when you leave, though, I countered. A look of pained confusion crossed the man's worn and acting face. I can't leave here. I'm sick. Although I couldn't get him beyond that judgmental labeling, I tried bypassing his defenses with a hypothetical situation. Well, imagine that you are no longer sick. What would you want to do? Over the following days, Bernard told me of his dreams of working in a motorcycle repair shop and earning enough money to buy his own motorcycle. Eventually, he saw himself on a long road trip with a friend to the Andes eventually crossing the mountains towards Argentina. As Bernard's dream of the future took more and more of his attention, his hallucinations decreased. His attending doctors seemed generally disappointed that Bernard rarely had any interesting hallucinations for him to write down. With Bernard's progress in mind, I settled into the chair next to Carmen's bed and began the technique Lila taught me. I focused my mind in order to contact those energy flows in my heart and head. Carmen seemed to take no notice of me. I visualized the positive energy flow from my heart to hers, sending the stream toward her with the suggestion that she communicate with me. I knew that I would probably receive her pain through my heart when she finally opened herself to me. Lila had explained to me the importance of sending the pain through the head out into the universe so that it did not remain trapped inside. Many psychiatrists I knew held the negative energy of pain inside, and thus became sick themselves. Hours went by before she even glanced in my direction. When she saw I was still focused on her, she looked away again. After another hour or more, she looked directly at me for a few seconds. After a few more minutes, a smile gradually formed on her lips. Then she went blank and looked away again. But now it felt more like a game of peekaboo than attempts to ignore me. She seemed incredulous that someone could pay so much attention over so many hours. I took a break and left Carmen to go down to the cafeteria to eat dinner. I watched two of my fellow residents trying to convince a table full of young nurses to accompany them to a party at the end of their shift. One of the other residents, Brigitte von Hoffenberg, a member of an old German family in Chile, came up and asked to join me. I was somewhat surprised by her request, since for weeks she had gone out of her way to distance herself from me, often consciously avoiding my company while making nationalistic remarks. In listening to me speak about my approach to healing in clinical meetings, however, she developed so much enthusiasm for my methods, she now treated me like her best friend. I told her about the experiment I was in the process of conducting with Carmen. She agreed to meet me at Carmen's room after I finished my meal and walked my evening rounds. I met Brigida in the hall outside Carmen's room about 10 o'clock, and the two of us went in together. The other patient in the room had finally put away her needlework and gone to sleep.
I moved the lamp closer so that we could see Carmen's face better. She was still staring into space, but she seemed much more aware of my presence. I relaxed and reconnected with my inner energy flows and focused them on her once again. It almost seemed she kept her attention elsewhere as an act of will. After a few minutes, she again checked to see if I was still focused on her, and the smile reappeared. I couldn't keep from grinning broadly, too. She wasn't talking, but at least she was starting to communicate. I renewed my commitment to getting her to speak. I almost completely forgot about Brigitte's presence, the noises from the hall, the look of the room and the bed, the feel of the chair. My attention was more intense and more tightly focused on Carmen. She looked away most of the time. She stopped smiling again. As it was getting very late at night, she seemed less able to maintain her upright posture any longer. She started to show signs of fatigue and sleepiness. She continued to check if I was still there and still focused on her. The progress she was making was more than enough to keep me and Brigitte evidently fascinated with this unorthodox type of therapy. I felt warmly empathetic as I paid more attention to Carmen. I began to feel sleepy too, but I felt I had to make a bit more progress before I gave up for the night. Around four o'clock that Sunday morning, Brigitte was the first of us to speak. We've been here for almost six hours. Aren't you going to say anything to her? I nodded. My impatience was getting the better of me too. I spoke to the quiet, motionless Carmen. Do you know who I am? She looked at me, but she did not speak. I thought I noticed one of her feet moving beneath the sheets. She seemed to be waiting for something more from me. I'm Dr. Warder. This woman is Dr. Von Hoffenberg. I'm willing to stay here with you all weekend if you want. Carmen leaned toward me somewhat. Her eyes scanned back and forth wildly, and she burst forth with a loud, no. Brigitte gasped and the woman in the next bed stirred. You don't want me to stay with you all weekend, I asked Carmen quietly. No, she shouted back almost as loudly as before. At this point, the older woman in the next bed sat up and peered across the room at the three of us. I tried to keep focused on Carmen. Would you like us to let you sleep, or would you like to talk some more, I asked her softly. Carmen closed her eyes and rattled off the word no over a dozen times much closer to my volume level. Can you tell me what you want, I asked her, still focusing positive energy toward her. Go away, she told me. Do you know where you are? Carmen made a sort of gurgling noise and then whispered something like, sounded, go away now. Do you know where you are, I repeated. Bad place, she said, much as you would expect a three-year-old to respond. Her breathing seemed faster. You're in Santiago in a hospital, I explained. Your mother brought you here. I relaxed a bit, but remained leaning forward in my chair. Mama, Mama, the young woman said. Her eyes scanned back and forth as if she were searching. Brigida eventually had to leave, and I took a much-needed nap before morning rounds. When I returned to Carmen later in the day, she continued talking with me in a sort of baby talk. By the end of the weekend, however... She had regained complete motor control of her body and was communicating virtually as a normal adult. She was out of the catatonic phase without medication. Love and presence seemed to work this miracle of healing. By the time of our weekly clinical meeting on Wednesday, most of my resident friends had come to look in on the young woman who was suddenly telling stories about the abuse she had endured from her employer. It was remarkable how normal her speech and movement were after lying in bed like a mute mannequin for over two weeks. Some of my colleagues were curious. Some chose to ignore what had happened, but some, thankfully, were very much with me and agreed that Carmen had been cured. My happiness and pride accompanied me into the clinical meeting. When it was my turn to report, I shared what I had done to cure the catatonic schizophrenic woman, calling it love therapy. I was reminded of the simple truth of the Beatles song popular at the time. All you need is love. I said that we needed to own the world of heart, that we needed a medicine based on relationships. Each person, I said, is infinitely more vast in scope 
more complex than appears to the naked eye. A patient is not just a symptom. We must begin, of course, with a good sense of who we are. In order to accomplish this and to get a sense of who our patient is, we have to employ a special sort of vision, a point of view that penetrates like an x-ray, images that might otherwise pass unnoticed. We need to see the invisible world that affects the visible, the fantasies and values locked in the patient's past, the cultural viewpoint. The success of this particular patient's treatment pleased me because it wasn't cold and analytical, I continued. Instead, I read between the lines, so to speak, to develop an intimacy that allowed us to relate heart to heart. When I finished, the professor stood up to silence the whispering back and forth among my colleagues. I have, of course, looked in on the patient, the professor began. I am quite pleased at how well she is now functioning, and I have signed off on your recommendation for discharge. The professor took his seat again and adjusted his eyeglasses on his nose. However, there is no such thing as a cure for psychiatric illness. Since the patient seems well at this point, we must conclude, doctor, that either the original diagnosis was an error or you are a genius. There is also no such thing as a genius, he continued. Therefore, this woman was never truly schizophrenic. My smile quickly faded. My apparent victory suddenly became a reason for derision. Our professor showed me an even more disheartening fact of my chosen field. Not only is there no room for soul in psychiatry, there's no room for experimental techniques or for cures. I later realized that a psychiatrist's identity is often so cut up in the doctor's omniscient, all-knowing role that he or she loses the ability to come to a deeper understanding of the patient. Because of this unwillingness or inability to change perspective, the psychiatrist often cannot empathize with the patient or admit there are answers to problems not found in textbooks, such as simply caring in the deepest sense for a person's spiritual needs. True spiritual healers I knew show profound empathy for the sorrowful condition to which people are sometimes reduced by illness, wrong choices, or unfortunate circumstances. So early in my residency, I was branded as a maverick in the field. I was often in deep trouble with academians, jealously guarding the diagnostic categories. For me, this closed-mindedness signaled the powerlessness of a system that knew how to define illness, but did not know how to bridge the hearts of the people involved. Medicine had become institutionalized by a language no one understood. People in pain and anguish were borderline type 2. Patients were not sad or afraid. They were suffering from schizoaffective disorder or Huntington's chorea. DSM labels and insurance categories had replaced empathetic understanding. The institutional clothing, the patient's smocks and the doctor's coats, further emphasized the isolation and differentness of the patient and the healer. I was sometimes caught taking off the identification badge and the official-looking white lab coat when I talked with my patients. Although I resisted it myself, it became clear to me that the medical system in which I worked was treating symptoms, but not facilitating real healing. The system perpetuated and actually deepened the split between body, mind, and soul. The list of chronic diseases lengthened as my fellow doctors, like the professor in the clinical meeting, lost hope in the concepts of cure and recovery. From early on, I realized we were in need of healthcare reform, not just a reformation of specific functions, but a fundamental shift. We needed to go to the root of the matter, the recognition of the essential definition of a healer as one who alleviates the sorrows of others with compassion. To do this, we needed a transformation of our consciousness, a transcendence beyond education and cultural indoctrination. I believed strongly that I could not be an effective healer if I were caught up in dramas and unhealthy behaviors of my own. I took to heart the old admonition, physician, heal thyself. I began working on myself as Lila had suggested. Among the techniques and practices I started using at this time 
or lucid dreaming, yoga, and Zen meditation. Whenever I found myself dreaming, I would take an active role in what was happening in the dream. I would ask questions of the other dream characters. I would go off and explore different rooms or buildings in the dream environment. A book Lila had recommended taught me yet another aspect of lucid dreaming. The book spoke of the sort of dream in which you are being chased by some person or monster. The Sufis try to stop running and face their pursuer in the dream. I found that the monster usually stopped too and waited to see what I did next. The book then suggested asking the monster for a gift. When I did this in my dream, the monster would very politely hand me a box and disappear. In the box would be a key or a magnifying glass or a mirror or something else that represented the solution to the problem the monster represented. When I awakened each morning, I did stretching exercises with controlled breathing from the tradition of Hatha Yoga. These included the well-known lotus seat in which the feet of the crossed legs rest on the opposite thigh. After practicing the lotus and a few other positions to prepare myself, I would bring out a small round cushion and sit on it with my eyes closed and my legs crossed beneath me. This Zen Buddhist practice is called sitting in Seizen, and the objective is to empty the mind of thoughts and achieve beginner's mind. I learned that this meditative state was analogous to soul awareness. In it, you observe every thought your mind generates without judging. You achieve the mindset of a young child to whom everything is new and wonderful. Sometimes I would go to a community center nearby when they held Zen meditations on Wednesday nights. Eventually, I invited the group to meet at my apartment on additional nights. I kept a journal at this time, too. In it, I kept track of my daily practices. I checked off my early morning yoga and Zen exercises there. I checked off my Wednesday Zen meditations there. Although I found these Eastern techniques for self-exploration quite helpful, I saw a problem arising among my fellow Westerners. The members of my Zen group saw in those Eastern traditions a hope for greater fulfillment than that offered by the traditions of the West. They immersed themselves with great zeal in their newly chosen Eastern tradition. They busied their minds with learning new rituals and a new language. After years of study and practice, however, my fellow students became disillusioned with the Eastern tradition. The longing and emptiness that originally sent them searching returned. Likewise, my spiritual teachers had become dissatisfied with the poverty and slow pace of the East and came West. They embraced the technology and materialism of this paradigm. Soon they too were faced with the same lack of fulfillment despite luxurious accommodations and adoring devoted followers. They seemed to grow weary, losing the spark of joy and adventure they had felt at the start of their pilgrimage to the West. In looking at this situation, I came to the conclusion that the search for fulfillment was not about accepting teachings and winning salvation. Instead, it was a process in which meditation or prayer was used to become more in charge of oneself the process of spiritual connection or salvation was really the awakening of the spiritual consciousness. This connection was not an abstraction and could not be intellectualized. Rather, it was the inspiration that comes when we truly love others and move forward on our true path. It became clear to me that in both Eastern and Western ideologies and religions, there was always a definitive moment, which was the spiritual experience in and of itself. This was then followed by a methodology or a ritual that spawned an ideology or a belief system. I wasn't really interested in changing my belief systems, but in integrating the timelessness and the universal love that I had come to associate with spiritual consciousness and soul awareness.
While sitting on the little cushion I used during my Zen meditation one day, I started to feel the timelessness and universal love I had come to associate with soul awareness. I felt this was a beneficial way to prepare for my meditation because my mind realized the centered, quiet state the Zen Buddhists recommend. Zen masters often talked of the underlying energy, which gave stability to the body and mind by just holding a meditation posture. My thoughts settled on the paradox of Westerners looking to the East and Easterners looking to the West in order to fill some void in their lives. Zen masters teach the use of koans. These are opposing ideas. In my case, East and West are encouraged to argue with each other in one's mind. This produces a friction that, like two sticks being rubbed together, ignites a fire called Satori. In the West, this concept is called the synthesis of opposites, or the resolution of a paradox. I found my meditations often gravitated toward this process of reconciling opposites. As I entered soul awareness, ideas that seemed at odds with each other, love and hate, change and satisfaction, giving and receiving, would blend into a feeling that these two were really expressions of the same principle. I came to realize that there were no polarities possible in the realm of spirit. When opposites became harmonious paradoxes, it was another sign that I had connected with my soul. In addition to a sense of timelessness and universal love, I knew I was in a state of soul awareness when I felt comfortable with paradoxes. As I meditated on the differing paradigms of West, survival, change, parts, and East, transcendence, fulfillment, wholes, I was surprised to find no synthesis occurring. The more I tried to place the various aspects of the two paradigms in opposition, the more they seemed to fade and vanish from my thoughts. I was left with myself. I began to think I had failed in bringing East and West together in my mind, but a fleeting intuition caught my attention. Perhaps the fact that I was left with myself was what I was supposed to learn, like the alcoholics with their wine, or materialists with their jewels and fancy cars. Searching for a new spiritual tradition was a form of external gratification. This spiritual materialism wasn't fulfilling because it temporarily relieved the pain and longing one feels, but it did not change the person whose life was fundamentally not working. I was left with myself in reconciling East and West because that is where the exploration and change needed to occur, within myself. A few months later, I heard a friend of mine on the psychiatry staff explaining a new case to a colleague in one of the hallways. My friend had diagnosed a young woman with dementia praecox. She was studying physical therapy at our hospital and suffered an apparent breakdown under the strain of her demanding training. He felt her behavior had regressed to almost autistic characteristics and a desire to receive affection for a weakened ego structure. He spoke with, uttered a long hmm. He leaned against the wall and suggested the young woman undergo a series of electroshock treatments that would sufficiently confuse her to the point of being re-educated. The psychiatrist glanced in a folder he carried and responded that he favored giving her strong tranquilizers similar to Thorazine, so she would become oblivious to her anxious feelings. I thought back to an 18-year-old woman under another psychiatrist's care two weeks before. She was beautiful, blissful, and the cause of great alarm in her family and in her doctor because she was in constant prayer and announced that she could talk to angels. To them, she was hallucinating. I wasn't as sure. The peace and calmness she exhibited extended to a depth I had seen in few people on our planet. 
Even her physical appearance took on aspects of the angelic. Her limbs and fingers seemed inordinately long, and the trance-like state of bliss she lived in created an aura around her that was all but visible. Between my rounds, I sometimes spent hours listening to her stories. She showed me her journals, and I often studied them in detail during my meal breaks. There seemed to be an uncommon wisdom in her writings, though the woman did not consider herself holy and wrote about her experiences with the greatest of humility. She once told me, angels will again enter into the lives of human beings as a new era begins. Many of these angels will instruct humanity in ethereal visions, in color healing, in realizing a superconscious world, in developing superhuman physics, in celestial nourishment, and in expanding consciousness. I was deeply inspired by her message, but she was not my patient and I could not prescribe treatment. She was given electroshock treatments and in her disorientation forgot all about the angels. This wise, blissful young woman became tired, confused, and I thought very unhappy. She was bloated, her face was swollen, and her limbs were now curled up and appeared to be palsied. I went to see this woman after her treatment. The Carmelite nun, who often made rounds at this hospital, was in the room when I entered. Did you know this woman was subjected to electric shock because she was spending too much time praying and talking to angels, I asked the nun. I am sorry if she had to suffer, the nun replied. She must have been very ill. I am not withholding anything from you, sister, I continued. This young woman was diagnosed as sick because she believed she could communicate with angels. Perhaps we have silenced an undiscovered saint. The nun glanced at the woman and then at me. And perhaps not, she said, as she turned and left. With the memory fresh in my mind, I resolved at that moment not to let another misunderstood young woman's life be ruined. I left the psychiatrist and the organicist at that point so that I wouldn't be caught eavesdropping. I found a nurse willing to tell me who the frightened physical therapy student was. The young woman's name was Katrina, and she was in a private room on the second floor. I had an evening shift that night, so I decided to pay Katrina a visit. I waited until after the orderlies had cleared the dinner trays to go up to the second floor. There I found the young, brown-haired, blue-eyed woman in bed, with the covers pulled up tightly to her chin. She looked startled when I came in, so I immediately told her I was a doctor and that all I wanted to do was to talk with her. I sat down in the chair next to her bed and introduced myself. She responded with a hello. Katrina, what are you afraid of, I asked quite innocently. For the next 25 minutes, Katrina told me the many reasons for her fear. The stories of difficult family members, threatening boyfriends, financial desperation, and brutal teachers nearly overwhelmed me. No wonder she had been unable to handle the stress, I thought. Before you go on, I said, interrupting her, I was hoping you might help me out by writing out those things that made you so afraid. I handed her my pen and prescription pad. On each piece of paper, write a few words to summarize the things that scare you. At the end of an hour, she sat up in bed with a huge pile of papers in her lap. I reached into my pocket and produced some matches. Katrina smiled. If you had the power, I told her, what is it you would do? She looked deeply into my eyes and shouted, I would burn it all. I picked up a metal basin off the floor and scooped the pieces of paper into it. I put the basin full of papers back on her bed and extended the book of matches to her. Go ahead, I said. The slips of paper with her fears on them burned slowly. As I observed her facial expression in the flickering light of the flames, she seemed to acquire a look of serenity. She looked down and asked me in a soft voice, Do you think I'm crazy? <laughs> 
No, I replied confidently. You are a very strong young woman who's had a lot of hardships to deal with right now. I don't know if I belong here, she said, as I took the basin of smoking ashes off the bed. I wasn't sure what she meant. You don't belong in the physical therapy school or you shouldn't be hospitalized. She glanced away and didn't respond. You can tell me. What do you want to know? Her deep blue eyes turned back toward me. How long do I have to stay here? I looked at my wristwatch and she laughed. No, I just realized that I have to finish my rounds soon. It's, it's up to you and your therapist. I don't have any say in when you are discharged. She was gazing at the ashes of her fears and smiling when I left her. Two days later, I was called into the office of the mental health department administrator. The administrator was an imposing woman in a gray suit jacket who sat behind a huge desk. I received a complaint about you yesterday, the administrator began. One of the psychiatrists came to me and claimed that a young woman, inexperienced resident, had changed the delusions of his patient. Evidently, the patient now believes she is well and wants to go home. From the patient's description, your supervising professor is convinced you are the resident in question. The woman slid some papers on her desk to the side and leaned forward on her forearms. Did you talk to this doctor's patient? Yes, I spoke to her. I shouldn't need to remind you, she replied, that you are not to interfere with patients under another physician's care. This incident will go in your academic file. You are not to make contact with this woman again. I sighed heavily and asked if the woman was to be discharged. The administrator replied that since she had admitted herself voluntarily, the hospital could not deny her request to be released. Katrina's doctor refused to speak to me when we passed in the halls. At lunchtime, I decided to take a walk to a nearby park. In front of the hospital, I saw Katrina hugging an older woman. I went up to her as the man loaded her belongings into a waiting car. I heard you were being discharged, I told her. Congratulations. She introduced me to her mother, who said, My daughter told me you came to her one night and helped her burn her fears away. She kissed me on the cheek. You are a brilliant man. Thank you for helping my daughter. Katrina echoed her mother's gratitude, and I waved goodbye as they got into the car and drove off. By this time, I had been downgraded from Maverick to troublemaker in the eyes of most of my professors. There was one professor who believed in my perspective, though, and I was fortunate to work with him for some time. We led groups of patients in healing circles. He had observed me working overtime one night, working with a single patient hours past the 50-minute time limit psychiatric staff was asked to observe, and he decided that I would be perfect for this new outpatient program. In the program, all the participants sat in a circle, told their stories, and prayed for each other. The professor and I led meditations to music. We brought in a dancer to lead the group in movement therapy. We brought in clay, and the participants made bowls and vases as a sort of occupational therapy. We discovered a new school of thought called Gestalt therapy, where the facilitators were asking patients to hold hands and hug each other and we incorporated that into our group as well. We even rented a bus and took the participants to the ocean for one session. They seemed to relax and open up more there than when we met in the city. Since the patients we saw did not have the severe problems of those in the psychiatric ward, they came voluntarily for our program and then went back to their lives between sessions. Word got out that we were not only allowing but encouraging our patients to touch each other. One of the nurses who had heard third hand and therefore didn't realize I was responsible for the program was horrified to hear that some doctor had taken his psychiatric patients on a bus trip to the ocean where they were talking to the trees. I joked with the nurse. I heard many of them weren't talking at all before that, so I'd say talking to trees was an improvement. <laughs>
the nurse stared at me and walked away. As my unusual methods slowly gained acceptance, or at least familiarity, more of my colleagues came to observe my work. One of the older psychiatrists on staff, Dr. Perez, stopped me in the hallway near the end of the afternoon one day. I have been impressed with the results you've achieved here, the psychiatrist told me with arms folded. Thank you, I said. They aren't all successes, I'm afraid. Oh, don't be so modest, said Dr. Perez. I think I know of a group that might be consistent with your philosophy. They meet here in Santiago. I think you might learn a lot from them. I'm always open to learning new things, I told him. What does the group do? It's a study group, Dr. Perez replied. If you're interested, I can set up a meeting for you to talk to one of the people in the group. I'd like that, I said. Thank you. The next morning, when I came on duty, there was a note taped to my desktop. Be at the corner of Calle Iglesia and Avenida Libertad at 6 a.m. on Friday. H. Perez. Six in the morning, I groaned to myself. I considered tracking down Dr. Perez and asking for a later appointment and some description of the person I was supposed to meet. As he wasn't in that day, I eventually decided to go ahead with the meeting and see what happened. My alarm clock went off at five o'clock that Friday morning, but I turned it off and went back to sleep for a half hour. Then I roused myself a bit and saw it was 530 I jumped out of bed and rushed through showering and dressing to make it out the door at 10 minutes to 6. I drove down Avenida Libertad, searching for Calle Iglesia, since I had never heard of the latter before. As Avenida Libertad approached the river, the residential neighborhoods were replaced by warehouses. On the brick wall of one of the warehouses, I spotted a sign that read Calle Iglesia. I found a place to park at the nearest corner and sat in the car for a few minutes, surveying the area. The sun had risen, but it was still low in the sky, so the building's lampposts and signs cast very long shadows. Through them passed the occasional laborer, getting off the late shift or starting the morning shift. One very weary-looking man in a loosened tie and rumpled sports jacket staggered by my car as if he were still trying to find his way home from a party the night before. No one appeared to be waiting at any of the four corners of the intersection, however, so I decided to get out and make myself more visible. I checked my wristwatch. It was already several minutes after six. When I got to the corner, I heard the calls of seagulls above my head and looked up. Two of the birds were making wide circles above the intersection. When they glided down Calle Iglesia toward the river, I followed. When I got a few steps down the alley, I noticed a one-story adobe building with a bell and a cross above the door. I wondered if I'd found the church for which the alley had been named. Dr. Warder, a husky male voice called from behind me. I jumped a bit in surprise. I didn't mean to startle you. I understand you are interested in learning more about your true self. Is that correct? I turned to face the man who was about my height, well over six feet tall, and wore a black, wide-rimmed hat, wire-rimmed glasses, and a gray tweed jacket. His features were Germanic. He was well-muscled, and I could see beneath his hat that his hair was cut short like an officer's. He had the air of an aristocrat, and I was duly impressed. He carried a package in a manila envelope under one of his long, thin arms. Yes, that is correct, I replied. The man handed me the package and explained, in this package you will find two books and a card. You are to read the two books and write a report on each. Send the reports and a short autobiography to the address on the card. You will then be informed if you have been accepted into the group. The man never introduced himself, nor did he stay around for questions. He handed over the package and started walking briskly away down the alley. He turned left onto Avenida Libertad and walked out of sight. By the time I followed him down the alley to the corner, he was gone. I returned to my car and opened the package. The card listed an address in England. The two books were by Idris Shaw. I recognized one of the titles as a book Lila had recommended. 
They were books of Sufi teaching stories. I took two weeks to finish reading them, then wrote down my reactions and sent the reports and a brief summary of my life to the address in England. While I was waiting for a reply, I continued my initiation with Don Eduardo. The second session with him brought more visions, but I didn't feel any closer to the insight that would release me from the bonds of my past and of my fears. On my third session with Don Eduardo, weeks later, we met on a Saturday night at his home. He was actually waiting in front of the house when I drove up. When I got out of the car, he led me into the house in intense concentration, with one hand holding a small drum and drumstick, and the other pulling on his mustache. We entered a room I had never been in. It was dark except for a single candle illuminating the center of a low table on which it rested. We sat on the floor next to the table. Don Eduardo beat the drum as he led me through the breathing exercise and relaxation that preceded the shamanistic journeying sessions. I again felt the numbness in my body and the clearing of my mind. Slowly, a scene materialized. I felt a gentle breeze and the moist, misty air on my cheeks. I opened my eyes to see a woman in white robes standing on a flat, moss-covered rock next to a moonlit waterfall. She seemed to beckon me forward with her deep blue eyes. She invited me to let go of all my attachments, everything I thought I knew about myself and all of my memories. Surprisingly, all the good things, the things I enjoyed, were easy to release. The painful memories and qualities about myself held on much more tenaciously. These painful memories, ideas, and perceptions hung on like parasites, sucking on my vital identity, my soul. Suddenly, the woman disappeared. A flaming sword hung in midair where she had been standing. I stepped up and took the sword in my hand, using it to sever the parasites from my body one by one. I swung the sword with great fervor and could feel myself drenched in sweat. When there were only a few of the parasites left, I started to feel anxious, even scared. What if I cut off the last of my perceptions and memories and found there was nothing left of me? I risked leading an isolated or an indifferent life once the final remnants of my false self were removed. Casting these fears aside, I swung the sword again, and the last of the parasites fell away. I was alone. Even the waterfall, the rocks, and the sword had faded away. I was surprised to find myself calm. The solitude was actually peaceful and comforting. At that realization, I envisioned myself in a sandy desert in the middle of the day. Sweat dripped from my body as the sun beat down upon me. There were no people, animals, or even plants, just sand and sun. In the distance, a door appeared. As I walked toward the door, it slowly opened to reveal an even brighter light than the sun above me. Then four guardian angels descended from above and gave me a box with a latched lid. They told me I needed the contents of the box to get through the doorway. When I asked what was in the box, one of the angels replied, Faith. When I stepped through the doorway with the box, the box disappeared, and I felt myself floating in a void. With each exhalation of breath, I was increasing my sense of surrender. Each exhalation brought more wholeness, more love, more ecstasy. I moved ever closer to oneness with the universal essence or soul. But I could not completely dissociate my body and join with that universal essence tempting as that joyous feeling was. That complete dissociation comes only with death, I discovered. And that event was not up to me. That complete dissociation was up to a higher will than mine. As I floated there on the edge of death, more overwhelmingly in touch with my soul identity than ever before in my life, an idea formed in my mind. I realized the most we can do while alive 
to connect to that universal soul is to perform service. We can act with kindness and compassion towards each individual on this planet. That, I decided, was the fourth sign of soul awareness. The universal love I felt in that timeless, paradoxical state of soul awareness manifested as an impulse to serve others. I was closer to my soul's path when I served others without the expectation of personal return. I floated over pyramids and temples and churches and monuments. They were all built in a futile attempt to capture and house the inner peace I now felt, the builders jealously guarding their perceived storehouses of inner peace. The idea struck me so funny that I laughed and laughed until my jaw started to hurt. I landed at a crossroads that I perceived was inside myself. One avenue was painted with the word public and the other with the word private. Beyond the crossroads was a temple. Again, the guardian angels appeared from above and urged me to approach the temple. When I opened the door of the temple, I experienced an intimacy and self-knowledge that was far deeper than either the public and private selves I had come to know. I raised my hands to heaven and the clouds parted. Down came beams of colored light and a host of celestial beings. I had now experienced the initiation I was meant to have as a teenager. When I came back from this shamanic state of consciousness and saw Don Eduardo sitting across from me in the dark room, I was surprised to look down at my body and find I was an adult, not a teenager. You are done here, Don Eduardo said. Your path leads north now. <laughs>